told me that as a client, I can pretty much say whatever I want, and you guys will applaud and like it. So I say that a bit in jest. Uh, but my name is Arielle, and I am here for the client perspective. Uh, I do, I think I am in the minority, so how many client-side folks do we have here? Wow. <laughs> I think we have three, maybe. So, okay, this is going to be fun. Uh, before we get started, um, as mentioned, I do work at Rogers, and since I don't think Rogers has historically been known as a company that's developed amazing advertising, uh, I can say that because I've only been there five months. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to give you a little bit of background on me. So I am American, uh, so if you hear me say process instead of process, that's why. Um, I have worked globally. I lived in Switzerland for three and a half years working on a joint venture that General Mills and Nestle had, uh, and that informed some of my perspective. And then I came to Canada about four years ago. You can see the brand as well, uh, so it's not just Rogers. Uh, I have a heavy CPG background, and I've also dabbled a bit in beer, uh, which was uh, ever so exciting. Uh, the commonality between all that, though, is it always goes back to the consumer. So uh, you'll hear that through and through. And this is really high. OK. Can everyone hear me? OK. So let's start with a little bit of humor. I have no video, and I did my own presentation. I didn't ask my agency to do it, unfortunately. So it will look like a client presentation, which I'm sure you can all appreciate. And you can also appreciate that I didn't ask my agency to help. So they had other things to do. Anyway, a little bit of humor. I think we've all been here when we thought about research. Uh, too expensive. Uh, someone's going to dominate the focus group. So we're just going to do something quick and easy. And then we're going to make it suit our argument and cherry pick the quotes that, that really support us. So um, I'm sure no one has ever seen that. Uh, but I have been involved with that. And I think if we're honest, everyone has. But before we get into my approach on research and, and my perspective on it, I wanted us to take a step back and think about why do we do what we do? And I won't assume, and I, I won't assume that everyone here is, is, is here for the same reasons. Um, but think about it. Why are we in this industry? Why are we, whether it's agency, client, or research, what motivates us and what drives us? Is it to build great work? To me, it is. It's all about building great work. Nike's Find Your Greatness campaign is one example. And some of these may be a little bit overused examples, but hopefully you'll know where I'm going with this. So find your greatness. Um, it did better than any of the Adidas uh, work during the Olympics. They grew, they had more awareness, et cetera, than Adidas did, and they were not the sponsor. Um, but there was something about this campaign that truly resonated with consumers. Is it creating an emotional connection with your, co with your consumers? 10 years later, the Dev Real Beauty campaign is still going strong. You can argue if all the executions are as good as some of the earlier ones, but it has moved their business. Uh, and it has redefined how people talk about beauty. It has contributed to the conversation. And finally, most recently, I don't know if folks have seen uh, the recent Under Armour commercials uh, and campaign. Uh, have folks seen it? Do we all? I assume everyone in, in the room is more up to date than most people on all the great campaigns. So uh, Misty Copeland, uh, they, they told a story with her that brands started to stand for purpose, uh, particularly for women. And they have seen phenomenal results. Not This is early days, but from their focus on women and, and creating a, a new brand story around that. Um, so we're here to create great work. But as a client, I also have to grow my business. Great work helps me grow my business, and that's what we actually need to get towards. And where does research fit into all this? Does research help? Does, does, does pre-testing make ads better? Do, if those campaigns had been pre-tested, would that have been the make or break? Probably not. I think those campaigns stood on their own for what they were, for the magic they created. And you don't need pre-testing to tell you that. Would it make it better? Maybe, marginally. But do you really need that to, to create great work? On the flip side, though, without research, could they have gotten there? If they hadn't invested time and money up front really understanding their consumer and, and learning about what truly motivates consumers, would, we have, would those companies have gotten to, to where they got on their own? I would argue not. So David Ogilvie, I'm sure everyone in this room familiar, but I think this quote is quite telling. So I noticed an increasing reluctance on the part of marketing executives to use judgment. They're coming to rely too much on research, and they use it as a drunkard uses a lamppost for support rather than for illumination. So I think more and more we're seeing some of this happen. And I'm sure we've all, well, you all have worked with clients that are, are, tend to do this. They hold on to, to scores and performance metrics and say yes or no to something because of it. But ultimately, it goes back to illumination. And that's where the beauty of research comes through, when it illuminates an insight. 
And yet when it's used incorrectly, you get pretty average work. And while no one would ever say they want to create average work, there's a lot of average work out there. So somewhere along the way, we're creating average work. And I don't think anyone would be proud of that. So what does that mean for the role of research? It helps us to understand the consumer, um, first and foremost. And I think, I think mostly when I look, I mentioned earlier that I had worked globally. Uh, and you can argue whether focus groups are good or bad. Um, but a story, something that stands very true and, and, and very clearly in my mind is when we were doing focus groups in Istanbul. We were marketing some, or doing some research on some serial stuff. And we were in a focus group. We were observing one, and it had uh, probably about eight or nine women, half Muslim, half Christian. They were all moms. And there was an epiphany for all of us behind the window. Um, there were no M&Ms in Turkey, so we did not have great food in the back. Uh, but when we were listening to them, there was this aha moment, and it will seem very blindingly obvious that moms are moms. doesn't matter what culture you're in, moms are moms. And more so... We also saw this, this epiphany that not only are they moms, but they also don't want to disappoint their mother-in-law. And so how they serve breakfast, which feels like a very minor thing, becomes a mark of how good of a mom they are and how, good, how well they'll be perceived towards their mother-in-law, which played a big role in, in, in them and, and their decisions. We wouldn't have gotten there, partly because of the culture, had we just... Um, I, we wouldn't have been able to do kind of immersion with them. It just probably wouldn't have worked. And that's where a focus group can add immense value. I've been in on projects where we did a full study. I was at General Mills in the U.S., and we did a study on weight management. And we went to consumers' houses. We truly immersed ourselves with them, and we went shopping with them. And we also saw their kitchens. And so what you learn is people say a lot of things, um, but they do very different things. And anyone who has really done this um, knows that to be true. So someone who says they eat very healthily, they don't snack, um, and, you know, they, don't, they, they seem like they're managing their weight just fine, and you open their drawers, and it's all full of snack food. And they clearly are eating it. And so, again, it's really going beyond the obvious to say what's motivating these folks uh, and, and what can we take from that and how does that inform research or how does that inform the ultimate uh, creative. Okay, so some of this will be redundant. You're hearing a similar theme. Uh, but research should not be your map. It should be a compass because there are a lot of different ways for me to get from home to work. But if anyone has driven on Richmond or Adelaide lately, like it's like traffic death. So if I follow my little Google Maps and follow the map precisely, I'm not going to get there in any reasonable amount of time. It's all about knowing the direction you want to go and, and figuring out how to get there. And ultimately, and I keep going back to this, um, it all starts with the consumer. And I know we're nodding and saying, yes, spending money up front makes all the difference in the world. But let me ask you this. How many of you guys here in the last month have actually done some sort of non-official consumer observation? So we've got maybe 20%. So that's pretty telling. And you could say, well, you know, it hasn't been any research organized. And on the client side, we're just as guilty of it. We get in our silos, and we think, okay, well, we'll, we'll get to research. But we're not our consumer. You may be lucky enough to work on a brand that you consume, but we're not our consumers. And when we get siloed like that, that lack of, of illumination, that's what hurts the creative process, not the research. Uh, and, you know, I, folks have talked about pre-testing. I'm not going to go into that too much because I think the bigger opportunity is to take the time up front to truly, truly understand our consumers in a way that is meaningful. And it's what makes brands like Apple so great. They live and breathe their consumer, and they are at their stores observing how consumers interact with them. I'm new to Rogers, so went to uh, the Eaton Center and did a little spin around all the different telco uh, uh, kiosks and stores, and it's amazing what you learn. So Bell, 98% coverage, and Virgin, Virgin Mobile is a part of Bell, so they also have 98% coverage. But our Fido guy told me, not knowing who I am, that we, get, we have 99.1% coverage. I'm like, great. So what is a consumer supposed to do with that? Does that little bit make a difference? Hearing how they talk about their brand, you realize that they're actually not saying what we want them to say. They're not saying what the brand is about. They're not talking about it in the same way. And you start experiencing your brand in the way a consumer does. Um, it could be just watching them shop. You don't even have to interact with them. But I urge you guys, everyone, both 
th those from the client side, research and agency, don't rely on organized research to understand your consumer because that's the value you guys bring, particularly from the planning side. When you know the consumer, customer, whatever you want to call it, when you know them intimately, you will get great insights, and from great insights, you get great work. And I can't stress that enough because we don't see that. But yet, with all that, the consumer doesn't always know. So oh, I guess all the, the, the good people put the Simpsons in, right? Consumers don't always know, right? Or they can't articulate it. And that's the danger in this, right? Where we, we go and we listen and we observe, but they're not, they're not futurists. They can't predict and tell us what we need to know. So I don't know how many folks are aware of a very infamous Tide example from the 80s. So A.G. Laffley, who's the CEO of P&G, when he was, I think, a brand manager, he was doing some consumer research. And this box, the cardboard box, got rave reviews from all their customers. They loved it. They loved the package. They loved how it worked. They loved everything about it. So he was doing some, he was doing laundry, apparently, with consumers uh, in the Deep South in the U.S. Uh, he went to Tennessee and Kentucky. And what he realized is the women, because it was the 80s and the women were doing the laundry, I guess, the women were not opening the laundry, the laundry box, the way they assumed they were. They were using screwdrivers and uh, nail files and anything they could find near the dishwasher or the, the laundry machine to open up the box. And yet they kept telling them they loved their packaging. Why weren't they use, why weren't they opening it the way it was intended? They didn't want to break their nails. But yet they still thought the package was fantastic. So it's just a, a word of wisdom to, rem, to remind yourselves to, to, to make sure that you are getting that, in, that insight. I just got the two minute warning, so I will go a little faster. So where does it all fall apart? Um, effective ads, they must communicate emotionally. I think we all agree with that. And yet, when we think, talk about pre-testing and some other measures, it's hard to get at that emotional connection. Um, research objectives aren't, being, aren't clear. So whether it's from the client, from the agency, if we're not making our objectives clear, we're not going to get there. Um, testing strategy and execution together doesn't work. Uh, and this one, I hopefully you guys will all appreciate. We always seem to have time to uh, copy test, but we never leave enough time for creative development. And we get down to copy testing and it doesn't work and suddenly we have more time to do creative again. If you put all that time up front and put research time up front and gave time for creative development, you probably don't need the back half as much as, as, as we rely on it. Uh, and then finally, teams that act in silos. I am tied to the hip with my strategic planner and my insights counterpart. And we're pretty much speaking every day working on one of these projects. And you can't not get there if you're all working in silos. And again, people say that all the time, but how, if you think about your own agency client relationships, or how, how are they? Are they like that? And are you really tied to the hip with them? You guys need to be living and breathing the client. If not, you're going to get into this mess, which is um, the ad testing roulette, where you can read it. But basically, um, hopefully, none of you have had the good fortune to be on the the, the fail side where you don't know why it fails, so you retest, and you still don't know why it fails, so you retest again. And you're continually retesting. Again, understanding the consumer up front, understanding their insights, you shouldn't end up in this position. So, in closing, at its best, I would say that marketing is a balance of art and science. But we'd be foolish to deny that research plays a role in helping craft the art. And yet we'd be equally foolish to rely only on research and not our experience and our intuition. And I'll leave you with a quote from my favorite book, um, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And while this has nothing to do with marketing or research, I think you'll agree when you read it that it is, has everything to do with what we do. Oh, with that big buildup and then I missed the slide. Uh, oh, wait, I'm not there yet, sorry. <laughs> I'm all uh, on my timing. So before we get to the great quote, because now I've really built it up, with or without research, I would actually just use this, chance, this time to actually encourage you guys to be passionate brand builders. This is what creates great work. It comes from belief and excitement. It doesn't come from data. Ensure your brand has a purpose. It's Simon Sinek with, you know, he, he's the start with why guy. People don't buy what you do. They, people don't buy what you, oh shoot, now I've messed up my quote. Um, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, so if you haven't seen the TED Talk, you should see it. Um, develop insight and foresight, with or without research. As I said, consumers aren't futurists, so you guys have to do this yourself. 
and get out of your fishbowl, get out of your office, go where your consumers are, watch what they're watching. Even if they're watching the most pitiful TV, watch it. Eat what they're eating, like just live your consumer as much as you can within reason. And I have gotten the end sign, so I will end with my quote now. So you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb inside of his skin and walk around in it. Atticus Finch to Scout into Kill a Mockingbird. Thank you guys. <laughs>